Okay, let's start. Hi everyone, welcome back, or welcome if you didn't join us on day one of our course in Program Therapy, the Challenges and the Opportunities. My name is Barbara Pino and I'll be your host today. And there's also a colleague of mine called Sheila. She's gonna help with the Zoom session as well. So if you need anything while we're starting out, just message me or Sheila and we'll be able to help you out. Before we start our lectures of the day, I just have some housekeeping to do. First things first, we're gonna have four lectures today and we're gonna have a break midway through. This is gonna be a 30 minute break. So it's a pretty large break. You can go for a coffee or you can just chill a bit. And in each lecture, you'll have some time for questions and answers. So how will that work? So basically, whenever we finish the lecture, I will be the one managing the Q&A and you can put raise your hand. You click that function in the reactions button on Zoom and you raise your hand and you can say your question out loud. We will talk to each other. So I give you the permission to do it. OK, so we're not we don't have much people talking at the same time. Or if you don't want to read your question out loud, you can just text it to me through the chat and I'll read it for you. No worries at all with that. About the slides of each presentation, we're going to have them in the shared folder I sent you earlier on in the email. So just be mindful that we will share them later on. We just don't have the lecture slides just yet, but we'll put them in there. If there are any questions at all, just feel free to, to send me a text and I will now stop my slide share. So Professor Juan, you can you can share yours and you will Juan Sip is actually the first lecture, and I'm just reading a short bio to introduce him. So Juan Sip is the department head of biomedical physics in radiation oncology at BKFZ, German Cancer Research Center. He's also the chair of medical physics at Heidelberg University and is a member of the EFOMP Scientific Committee, representing the, G, the GMP German Society for medical physics. Joan, you can go ahead with your talk. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Thank you. There you go. Uh, for some reason, I'm having difficulty. With the slide? No, with the sound. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay, fantastic. I'm sorry. So I no want worries. to thank the organizers of this meeting, Joanna Diaz and Juan Hu Kao, for inviting me. And I would request that you write the questions in the chat so I can uh, probably uh, deal with them later when it's possible. All right. All right. So I'm going to talk about what are the main future challenges in proton therapy. I've extended this overview to also ion therapy because they go hand in hand. All right. So a quick overview of my presentation. I give a little uh, introduction to proton therapy, which is normal. I provide an overview of the advantage of protons and ions relative to photons. This is a, a simple overview. And I also provide a little bit of the physics that's needed to understand a lot of the proton interactions. Then the main three topics that I will address in this future overview is radiation activated immune response. So I'm gonna spend some time talking about how we can activate the immune response with radiation. This is one active line of research in my group, and we will, I will mention a little bit of this. Then I'm also going to talk about flash radiation. This has become an extremely hot topic in the last three, four years. We are actively doing a lot of work on flash, and so I will mention some of the key ideas of flash. And the third one, which I think is also a very important topic, is the microbeam and mini beam irradiation that also provi provide some true benefits. Sorry, Professor, we stopped hearing you. I think it was a problem with your mic. Can you unmute yourself? Sorry. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Go All ahead. Right. So I'm not sure where you got me. So I will I will also address the final topic of mini beams and microbeams. So these are three main areas which I think will have a huge impact in the future in the next 10, probably longer years. Okay, so let me continue with the presentation. So I always like to start with this, the pioneering paper from Robert Wilson published in 1946. So it was really a breakthrough paper and this paper had many ideas in it. So we, we tend to forget how breakthrough this was. So one of the first things, yes, it proposed that protons can be used clinically. This is really something completely new. So no one at the time was even thinking of ions or protons for therapy. So this was a breakthrough. 
but it also proposed that you know you have accelerators you can accelerate these protons and you can use them relatively easy so this is also a technological step so the therapy the clinical work required the technological step and this is a key point then the other point is how do we irradiate a large volume so it's not just about putting one bright peak but we have to put a few bright peaks with maximum dose all in the tumor and this was also something that was proposed and then the key point is that it was already identified in 1946 was that we really have an advantage of sparing normal tissue to radiation so that's really a key idea that already started with the first paper and then finally how do i produce a spread out bright peak so how do i deliver multiple bright peaks to to address a volume problem so this idea of the modulator wheels was one of the ideas already also suggested in 1946 so it is a very good and extensive study showing all these ideas in one all right so now i also like to provide a lot of the people that work in the field that are um, an overview of the main interactions of protons so that we don't forget what is the basic physics that's that's involved right so we have the uh, photon ionization and excitation where the proton comes through and can either excite or ionize an electron so here you have an elect injection of an electron you have the ionization and you can also have the potential excitation where the electron is not ejected then you can also have a so-called nuclear interaction and this is pretty common for protons they have so-called a coulomb scattering which is an elastic scattering over a nucleus so the the coulomb scattering happens uh, is a physics process but as the proton crosses the medium it will have many coulomb scattering so multiple coulomb scattering is a mix is a multiple step of coulomb interaction so it's not only one but it's many many multiple steps and they are all elastic scattering and this leads us to usually blowing up the beam so the spread of the beam increases as you go in deeper and deeper then you can also have your so-called uh, elastic scattering nuclear collisions where you have the nuclear collisions and you could potentially have a recoil of the nucleus so here's an example of a recoil of a nucleus and you have a proton being emitted at a large angle now and then finally, you can also have the nuclear interaction where you have a non-elastic nuclear interaction and you produce these uh, so-called uh, other elements. So you can have a neutron or gamma emission. You can even have potentially an electron or positron emission. And you have also the remaining nucleus coming out. So these are the main interactions that are usually involved in the protons. And it's good to give an overview of these before we start. All right, so now we come to the idea of what is the advantage of protons or ions relative to photons. And I've noticed that a lot of people mix this concept up. So here is an example of a Bragg peak in the dotted blue line. And the solid blue line is your so-called spread out Bragg peak made up of many little Bragg peaks. And the yellow line represents your X-ray beams. And you see that if you want to cover the tumor, you're going to give a lot of dose upstream here. But there is no dose on the downstream part here compared to X-ray. So in case of X-rays on a one beam by one beam basis, you have technically less dose per beam, okay? You don't really do X-ray therapy planning with one or two beams, so I want to emphasize that, but if we compare one beam to one beam basis, we see that there is this disadvantage here, primarily at the exit side, where you have absolutely no dose or low dose in the case of ions. And this allows us to really spare organs that are in that area. So we see that we have a control of the back peak. We see how we have a rapid distal fall off here. And we allow energy modulation to achieve the so-called bread uh, SOBP spread out Bragg peak. So multiple Bragg peaks with the energy modulation will produce your spread out Bragg peak. And finally, there's also one uh, biological advantage. Let's say that is really important. Also, the RB is so close to that of photons that it is not a big jump from a photon therapy clinic to a proton therapy clinic. Right? Although this RBE is like an average RBE, so we are now looking at a variety of different RBEs which are LT dependent. But I want to say that most of the clinics use this average RBE, 1.1. Okay, so how do we quantify protons relative to photons? So here is, for example, a famous sigmoidal curve. And on the horizontal axis, you have your dose. And on the vertical axis, you have your so-called tumor control. So 100% tumor control means I've wiped out all the cancer. So if I increase my dose, I have this famous sigmoidal shaped curve that eventually at some dose, I will reach 100% tumor control. And in many cases, what happens is the uh, normal tissue curve is offset to the tumor one a little bit to the right. And this 
offset is usually related to DNA repair. Healthy organs have a slightly better DNA repair. That means they can resist radiation at slightly higher dose. This ultimately is not valid for all cancers, but in most cancers, this is true. And this tiny offset gives us an advantage that we usually take advantage of. So we generate the so-called benefit curve. And technically, we would like to have the so-called benefit point of treatment. So the white curve is to the right for toxicity. The red curve is to the left for tumor control. And the benefit is where we want to be, somewhere around this peak for when we're treating. We want to maximize tumor control at the minimal um, toxicity as possible. In most clinical practice, we are never that high in toxicity. So we are not at, say, 50% toxicity. We are much, much lower in the 10 to 20, sometimes even a little higher toxicity. And at this level of toxicity, the tumor control you see is in the order of 30 to 40%. So it's not great. So this is one tumor case where we would struggle to achieve tumor control with photons. So the white curve represents the photon curve. If, however, we use protons, we in principle should be able to reduce the dose to the organs. And this allows us to literally offset the, uh, the toxicity curve to the right. And now if we do the same level of toxicity and we compare the tumor control, we see a huge increase in the tumor control for the same level of toxicity. <clears throat> this offers us a big benefit of using ions or protons where we can reduce the toxicity to the healthy organs. Okay. So this is the main advantage, the ability to reduce the dose to the healthy organs which allows us then to achieve higher, higher tumor control for the same level of toxicity if we were to do uh, photons. All right, so let's start with the uh, biology part of the, uh, of the future. So radiation activated immune response is a very, very biology oriented field. And it has the need of physicists working it to understand how the radiation triggers this. So here's an example <coughs> of a mouse that's irradiated with an implanted tumor. So here is the case of a mouse that's untreated. The exponentially growing curve is a mouse that's untreated without radiation. And the case of a mouse that is treated with radiation at this point here. And you see in this case that the, the tumor stops growing. So you have this change in tumor response. And this mouse is a competent mouse that has a competent immune system. So the immune system is fully functional and it can help with the response. And you see an immediate change here. Yeah, the immune system takes over. And there is something. Now, if we did the same irradiation in a mouse where the immune system is deficient, you see a completely different response here. So on the left, you have a very strong response of the, of the mouse to the, to the treatment. And here you see on the right, a very poor response of the mouse to the treatment. You see the, in, the, the one with the deficient immune system is not really responding well. So the treatment is not working technically. And it's very small difference to the one that is unirradiated. So we see clearly that the immune system plays a major role in, in, in the response. And if you also look at dose fractionation, which fractionation is better for treatment when we do that? Well, here's an example of two types of cancers. PC3 is a prostate cancer, LLC is a lung cancer. And we see different fractionation regimes. So 10 times two, six times four, three times eight, and two times 12. And you see the ones that are best are the ones that have these long uh, exposures. So the green, six times four, three, eight, and 212s are very specific to the prostate cancer. You see, they have the ones that have the best. Well, if you, you look at the lung cancer, you see again the 2 times 12 is one of the best and the 3 times 8. So you see clearly the fractionation plays a role in this whole process. And why is fractionation so important when we talk about immune response? Well, if you use your normal fractionation scheme, which is available nearly at most all centers, the radiation dose is given in small steps. And that has a really poor Im immune response. So this little red ball represents the immune response that you triggered by radiation, which is terrible. So you see very small doses don't really work well in triggering immune response. If you go into moderate uh, uh, doses from three to 10 gray, you start to have a, a very strong immune response. So you see these little three red balls, that's your immune response that's triggering. And if you go to very high doses above 10 gray, you see a much stronger immune response. But the problem is, that although you have a very strong delivery uh, uh, activation of the immune response, you're also damaging a lot of vasculature that allows you to be efficient. So the best way to trigger immune response is to avoid destroying your vasculature that allows you to, to deliver the, the immune system. So here, the best way to, to activate your immune response is in this moderate hyperfractionation regime of three to 10 gray. So this plays a critical role. You have immune response, you have the, all the vasculature that is needed to deliver your immune cells, your T cells, 
all the way to the tumor to allow you to activate the response of your body to the cancer. So as an example of what happens, so when I irradiate a tumor cell, the tumor cell has not only tumor cells, it has a variety of other cells present, healthy cells, immune cells, stroma cells, endothelial cells, it has everything present. So when you irradiate the cells, they secrete these so-called molecules, these so-called molecules that can be monocytes or not macro macrophages or even dendr dendritic cells. So this is a dendritic cell that's entering the lymphatic system and eventually moving towards the lymph node. So in the lymph node, you trigger then your immune response and that basically creates your T cell. So this little green ball is your T cell. Oops, sorry, wrong direction. T cell that will go back and deal with the tumor. So here's my T cell that has been activated and is going to deal with the tumor. And this is really wonderful if it works the right way all the time. But most of the time, in order for the T cell to dock onto the tumor, it needs to be able to use one of these docking uh, uh, systems. And so here, the tumors tend to suppress this docking system, protecting themselves from this immune response. Another big advantage of the T cell is it can literally wipe out non-irradiated metastasis. So if the immune system is working really well, it can go somewhere else in a different region of the body that is not irradiated and go there and deal with any metastatic form of the cancer. And again, you need to be able to have this T cell dock onto the tumor cells. And that's usually done through a PD-1, PD-L1 connection. So here, this PD-1 is the red one, the PD-L1 connection is this purple one. And this is where, in fact, a lot of the tumors can block this, right? So we, the immune response needs the help of radiation in, in many times, but it also would be really good to have some anti-immunotherapy that's targeting this block. So I hope it, it's clear now that when I radiate the cancer, I activate an immune response through this connection of dendritic cells to the lymph node, which then produce the T cells. And the T cells are wonderful for the main cancer, but they're also really good at dealing with metastatic cancer, as long as these docking systems are working. So here's an example of that uh, distant effect of the metastasis, which we usually call the abscopal effect. Here's an example where we have a variety of mice that are irradiated, and then we see the growth. So at zero gray, you have the exponential growth. At eight gray, you have a, a lower growth because you have the effect of the radiation. At 30 gray, you've killed all the tumors, but at this time, you've also killed the mice. So 30 gray is far too much. And then you have the fractionation where you have the problem of you, you do work really well, but you have a problem that none of the mice have survived. So this is all radiation. If you had in the immune uh, immunotherapy, so a CTLA blocker, CTLA-4 blocker, you see suddenly that at 33 times eight gray, you're surviving six out of seven mice. So you see the importance of adding radiation with immune immunotherapy. So alpha CTL-4, will maximize your effect of radiation. And this is one of the lines of research in many groups now, how to combine radiotherapy with immunotherapy to literally allow a better docking system of your T cells. Here's a dendritic cell. <clears throat> and now I'm gonna explain a little bit about the abscocal effect. So when you have uh, the so-called dendritic cells, you, these will then trigger, uh, they are very, this production of the dendritic cells they, they focus on these double strand breaks. So about here, you can see where my mouse is, there's your double strand break. So as you irradiate cancer cells, when they, when they break up, when they die, they emit all these double strand breaks and they enter into the system and they are caught up by these dendritic cells. And with the double strand breaks, you activate what is called the C-gas and sting pathway. And with the sting pathway, you then trigger the emission of your, CT tel, CT, your CD8 T cell, your lymph, your white cell line white blood cell line. So it's the T cells that eventually will go back into the tumor to allow it to kill the tumor. But this whole production of the T cell from the dendritic cell needs a certain dose level. So you see here that at zero gray, two, four, eight, and 10 gray, you have this increase of the double strand break production. And this is really important because it's this increase of the double strand break with the dose that will activate these T cell response. However, above 10 gray, you stop to have this decrease increase. Now you suddenly have to have a drop of the T cell of the double strand break. And this is really curious. Why is it at 10 gray, you have this magic change? And if you look carefully, there is something called the T-Rex-1 expression, which tells you about a, a protein that's in the cytosol that degrades these double strand breaks. So as this protein gets activated more and more and more, you start to break down these double strand breaks directly in the cytosol. 
right? So you don't have the ability to trigger anymore this dendritic cell. So your immune system is highly active between four and 10 gram. And beyond that, <clears throat> you start to really downregulate your immune system, which is a bad thing. So in this order, you want to have radiation with immune system between four and 10 gray. This is the big, big thing. <clears throat> All right, so what about charged particles? So there was a study out of Heidelberg that was published in 2019 where they compared carbon ion therapy with photon. And they found that the carbon ions was better in many things, right? So they were able to destroy better the cancer cells. They were better at hypoxic cells. They were better at destroying glioma stem cells, and they were better at destroying endothelial cells. This was a really important. The other thing is they also had an advantage of uh, blocking these other things called microglia, SDF1. And so this was also a big advantage, which is not the case for photons, right? Photons don't block these things. But the most important thing was the T cells. So carbon ions actively amplifies T cell production, while photons don't. And this is something we are actively studying for pancreatic cancer. We have basically a manuscript nearly complete where we have this mechanism, how this works. So carbon ions actively upregulate the T cells. So imagine now you, you release your army, the army that's inside your body, and all your T cells, and they go after the cancer. This is amazing that you can do that with carbon ions, but it's not possible with the photons. So it's really important that this is true for carbon ions, but there is still the question, which ion is ideal for this immune activation? Could this immune activation also be present in flash or other types of modalities? And this is something that we're also looking into. All right, so one of the main challenges I, I envision for the ra radiation activated immune system is how do we maximize the radiation activated immune response? So you've seen how important it is. If I can activate the immune system, it will drive the cancer away. But more important, it would also reduce the metastatic nature. So you have to keep in mind that 90% of the patients that die of cancer die because of metastasis. If we can activate the immune system, we can protect ourselves. And this is the second point. Can we reduce the metastatic nature of the cancers by triggering this full effect? Yes. But how do we do it is the question. That's really one of the big questions out there. All right, so the next hot topic, which I think is really important to consider for the future is flash. And flash, has a very important role in protecting organs. So there has been extensive publications in the last five years showing in, in animal studies and even in patients how important flash is. So to understand flash, you need to understand oxygen. So you cannot do both uh, one without the other. So oxygen is the key mechanism, the key sensitizer for radiation. And he has a simple oxygen curve where in the horizontal axis, I have oxygen pressure in millimeters of mercury. And on the vertical axis, I have the sensitivity, right? And usually, where we usually use the hypoxic condition as our reference one. So at zero oxygen levels, I kill one cell. If I increase my oxygen levels, I will kill between one and three cells. So that's what oxygen is doing. It is literally sensitizing the tumor to radiation. So as I increase from zero to around 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury, I've literally doubled and close to triple the effect of radiation. And this is the key driving mechanism of radiation, radiation success. So the more oxygen I have in the tumor, the more sensitive they are to radiation. Now, here is the key. Cancer cells have usually a much lower level of oxygen when compared to healthy cells, which sit up here. So technically, when I do radiation therapy, my healthy cells have a much higher cell kill, okay? because just because of the oxygen. Now, imagine there is a therapy out there called FLASH that can swap this order, right? Put the healthy cells damage from three down to one. That would be really revolutionary. So that's what FLASH does. It brings the oxygen damage down from three all the way down to one. So by doing that, you have an ability to reduce your damage to your healthy cells with a simple way of delivering FLASH radiation. And that's the main driver. So just to emphasize what is flash. So if you don't know, imagine going to the beach for you know, one year, you have a, a job work that allows you to spend a full year every day on the beach. Yeah? That's your standard radiotherapy, let's say. If you do flash, imagine giving all that radiation in one day. So 360 days of radiation in one day. So that's what flash is. You give the, the amount of radiation that you would normally give in 
at a rate that's 500 times faster. So this is unique. Why is it that at this high flash rate, I have no auction damage? And that's the question that has been bothering the whole field, because if we can control oxygen damage, we can control toxicity. So that's the main difference from the left to the right. We just increased the rate at which we give the radiation. All right, so I've already shown you the uh, oxygen enhancement curve. Let's see the first set of data that showed this. So there's the famous paper from 1969 uh, by Barry, and they measured exactly that. So here is in the white dots, your standard cell kill of cells for normal oxygenated co cobalt delivery. And if you deliver at high dose rates, at flash rates, you have a completely different curve. This is this black line. And the black line literally follows a hypoxic condition. That's why you have this basically completely different shape. For normally oxygenated cell lines, you have the white cell, the uh, white points, and the black points as well. And they observed this in for hamster cells, and they also observed that for mammalian cells or HeLa cells. And another study before even had the ability to measure hypoxic cell lines. So here is the hypoxic, fully hypoxic uh, cell survival. We have the nitrogen gas, no oxygen is present. And here is the delivery of your standard cell line. And then you have the so-called inflection point where you now have, and the flash conditions follows the hypoxic curve. So this is one of the first two studies that literally show that what flash is doing is taking the cell kill from three to one, making the cells hypoxic. All right, so then this was in 1960s. <coughs> Sorry, this was in the 1960s, but the paper that set the whole field alight was published in 2014 by Fovidoui. <coughs> Sorry. In, this <coughs> in the study from <coughs> in the study from 2014. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> in the study from 2014. <coughs> Um, <clears throat> they looked at the irradiation of um, mass tumor, uh, mass lung, <clears throat> and what they observed is that if <clears throat> if they flash the lung of a mouse, you see a difference in response between the <clears throat> healthy uh, in the in the mouse lung. With flash radiation, you have completely very low level of fibrosis, <clears throat> while if you do the normal irradiation, you have much higher level of lung fibrosis. So this is a huge side effect, which is the toxicity. And this reduction is in the factor of one to five. So you see 80, 90% level of fibrosis compared to 15 to 20%. And the difference was just <clears throat> above everything, this high dose rate of 60 grade per second compared to 1.8 grade per minute. So this is a huge increase in the toxicity, in the, <clears throat> in the dose rate, but a very significant decrease in toxicity. They also did histology analysis to check that the cells look completely different, and they do. So this is called an H&E plot, and healthy cells control is on the left here. And in the middle, you see the H&E of, of cells that are affected by the radiation. And you see all this purple region, which means the cells are dying. And while on the right, you see much much higher level of the cells of surviving with very little effects. And you look and you compare it to the, the right to the, to the left, and you see they look much normal except the center where the conventional radiation has done a lot, a lot of damage. So the famous Forbidon paper also looked at tumor control. So although we have lower toxicity, we also want to check that the radiation is working for the tumor. And this is very important to guarantee that your radiation treatment is, is, uh, is efficient. So they looked at human head and neck carcinomas in xenografts, and they exposed uh, 20, close to 20 grade conventional, and they compared with flash 15, 20, and 25. So the key results of this blue curve here, which is your conventional radiation with the purple curve, which is your flash, and you see that the level of tumor control is practically identical. Okay, This study was done seven years ago, and the recent studies have shown there is a small difference between the two of them in the flash control. <clears throat> but still, it's pretty amazing that the tumor control is very close between conventional and flash. All right, so, and they even noticed that at 25 gray with flash, I achieved complete tumor growth rest. So there is no longer the tumor, of course. <clears throat> then there was another follow up study in the brain of mice done by the group in California, Montegrulet et al. 
<clears throat> and they studied the effect of oxygen on flash. So the main study here was the control and the control by oxygen. And how did they transport oxygen into the animal? They used something called carbogen. So carbogen, carbogen allows you to increase your oxygen content in the blood by around 50%, which is a huge increase. And so if you radiate the mouse with, with carbogen, you have the same cell kill here. But if you irradiate the mouse <clears throat> under flash conditions, you see that the increase in oxygen led to a decrease in flash protection. So here is the case where you have uh, no oxygen, 10 gray flash. And here, if you have the case of 10 gray flash plus oxygen, you see a significant decrease in the, in the flash protection. And that shows clearly that the mechanism is related to oxygen. The oxygen is the so-called controller or uh, main driving uh, mechanism behind flash protection. The more oxygen you have, the harder it is to achieve so-called flash protection. And so they studied a lot of things. One of them was this neurocognitive uh, deficit related to your flash. <clears throat> and that's what's represented here, right? So the key idea is that what I've already presented in the beginning, auction is the driver of your flash protection. The more auction you have, the less flash protection you have. They're literally inversely related. So the first flash treatment was done in 2019 in Lausanne. Uh, it was published in the Borges 2019 paper. <clears throat> and here it was related to a patient that had been treated for lymphoma, had been treated before by many times by lymphoma. On the right, you see the example of your lymphoma cancer. And this poor patient that had so many interventions that probably there was no other option. So he had 110 previous localized skin RT over a period of 10 years with no success. So he has an example of what happened when the patient arrived for the clinic. Then they had a flash treatment. And in the flash treatment that was given, they gave a single dose of 15 gray at a rate of 167 gray per second. So extremely high flash rates and the way electron beam. So the 5.6 MeV electron beam was used. And what they saw, the side effects were minimal. And they saw a grade one epithelitis and the grade one edema. <clears throat> so technically the grade, this is like your normal going to the beach side effect. And here is an example of what you see. You see the skin reddening and you, you see the seam sensitizing here. But after a few weeks, it's all gone. So <clears throat> in the period of three weeks to five months, so more than 10 days, you have clearly the cancer is gone. And above everything, you see the, can the skin looks partially healthy and it's getting better with time. So this is amazing that the cancer was completely wiped out with minimal side effects to the, to the healthy skin. So that's the study that was done in 2019 for a patient. A more recent study has just cured 10 patients <clears throat> for protons. And that study has been running at Cincinnati Children's Hospital in the US. And their main idea was to treat uh, patients with a single dose of eight gray for, pain, for a painful set of bone metastases, usually located in the legs, okay? <clears throat> and this study was called FAST01 study. And what I heard recently is that it secured all 10 patients in October already. So all 10 patients have been occurred. And the whole study was based on a preclinical assessment published in animals, uh, published in, um, in cancers. And the group had investigated irradiation with flash of, a, of, a, of, of the legs of a mouse. And they showed that with eighth grade, that could achieve uh, tumor control at the same time with very little skin toxicity. So this was the kind of the preclinical study that allowed them to do the, the clinical study. <clears throat> so what are the main ideas that need to be addressed when we do flash? Well, one of them is why does flash protect organs and not affect tumor control? This is still an important question. And it's really, the question is how does it do the protection? We don't understand how somehow it really gets rid of the oxygen effect. And all clinical applications have used one beam, electrons or protons, but how do we implement flash with multi beam? So if you want to use this in the clinic, we have to be flexible. We have to have more than just one beam. We have to be able to use two, three or four beams, and we have to be able to go deep, right? So both the skin treatment and the bone metastasis, the treatment depth was usually a few centimeters. So it's not a lot. So sometimes we need to go deeper than that, 15, 20 centimeters. How do we do that? that these are the main questions that really arise from <clears throat> the future that we need to address. So I also want to mention that the key idea here, radiation gives a certain survival, flash increases potentially that survival by 50%, 
And my group are actively investigating this mechanism, and we have potentially developed a way of blocking O2 to understand this flash effect. But uh, the key idea is that somehow flash is blocking the O2 damage. How is the question that needs to be answered? All right, now I come into the third topic, which I think is really important that people have seemed to have forgotten about when we talk about flash, which is the micro beam and the mini beam. This has a huge potential from both the radiation protection part, but also from the tumor control part. So what is a mini beam or a micro beam? So when we do radiotherapy, we tend to give uniform uh, distributions of dose, right? He has a flat dose and the tumor is in this region here, in this flat region. So we give a uniform dose in many cases. <clears throat> and if we use multiple beams, we can produce a uniform dose distribution at the end. In the so-called spatially fractionated RT, we don't give a uniform dose. We give like peaks, a peaks and valley regions. So we have this zigzag region, and in the peak dose, we give a very high dose, and in the valley dose, we give extremely low dose. So we have a huge difference between the two of them. We usually define the peak to valley dose ratio as the ratio from the peak to the valley, and we usually define the CTC as the distance between two, two peaks. CTC stands for center to center distance. <clears throat> so the center to center distance is the CTC, and the peak to valley dose ratio is the ratio of the two dose values. So here's an example of it. <clears throat> and uh, you usually tend to have a factor of 20, sometimes higher in your peak, the peak, to do, peak valley dose ratio. <clears throat> and you don't have a value of zero gray. So you have a slightly non-zero level of dose. But <clears throat> usually we want to try to achieve as low as possible this valley dose and a very high peak dose if possible. So one of the first studies done many, many years ago in 1961, they found that if you have a very, very narrow beam of 24, 25 micrometers, that the radiation damage through the microbeam is not as, as damaging as if you have a slightly bigger mini beam. So this is kind of the first paper that launched the idea of the mini beams and the micro beams. It launched literally the micro beam area. And it was published in 1961. And they found that at the very narrow beams, there is some strange effect that allows the tissues to sustain a huge amount of radiation. And they measured this point of inflection. They, they saw that around 50 micrometers, you have this change of resistance and the, the, the cells can resist up to 4,000 gray or more. So we have this inflection point that happens at a very small microbeam <clears throat> in the order of your 25 to 50 micrometers. So this was something that starts to raise the question, why don't we deliver all the radiation in the form of microbeam where we have much higher uh, resistance to, to damage? So they measured this in a variety of tissue. He has the brain and you see the cuts of the microbeam study. So this is a 25 millimeter peak dose and a CTC of 200. And you see the tiny little narrow radiation slits right here. This is your peak valley, peak regions going through the brain, producing all these tiny slits of radiation. <clears throat> and they found that the, the, the mice with this type of radiation, that they were alive for many years after that. So that no animal showed any CNS damage from the clinical science. So, and they gave extremely high doses, right? So they gave in the order of 300 gray. So this is something that the mice should not sustain, but for some reason, after give, being given this high radiation, these microbeams, they lived well, well beyond their uh, lifespan. So here's an example of what you would see if you look at DNA damage. The microbeams are the pink ones where you see, sorry, the microbeams are these pink ones where you see most of the radiation damage and the, and the valley, so the peak region is the, the pink one and the valley region is the blue one and you don't see any DNA damage or you see very little DNA damage. So it says that as the radiation is going through, the damage is primarily concentrated in the, in the peak valley, in the peak region, not in the valley. So in the valley, there's very little or no damage occurring. Most of the damage is occurring in the peak region. So this was a, a unique thing. So how is it that we are controlling the tumor if we're in the valley? There's no DNA damage or very little of it. So how do we control the tumor in this region? <clears throat> so there are different ways to deliver uh, microbeams or mini beams. One way would be to deliver a set of microbeams that eventually produce a homogeneous region in the tumor. But most of the groups are now investigating the so-called spatially fractionated through the whole site. In this case, you have to shoot through the patient and you produce a slit of, 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 of spatially fractionated beams. In this case, you see, for example, it's kind of, a, it's a proton where you have a very narrow beam that it's slowing, blowing up and producing 
the spread out of the elite, <clears throat> but it's still spatially fractionated, as you can see. <clears throat> so Yolanda uh, Prezado and her group, they've been investigating proton minibeams, and they've shown recently a study where they investigated <clears throat> a rat glioma and how it works with the proton minibeams. So what they did is they shot through the mouse <coughs> with the radiation, and you see the radiation covering the whole mouse. <clears throat> and the, the minibeam is called a minibeam because you have a CTC of the order of millimeters. So you see a CTC of 3.2 millimeters, while you have a very narrow peak of radiation. <clears throat> so in their study, they had four study groups, of which I'm going to emphasize two, which are the, the ones that are the most important, is the ones that were non-irradiated, that lived approximately 18 days. So you see the non-irradiated, which is the control diet very quickly. <clears throat> and then you have the ones that were treated with mini beams, proton mini beams, and some of them, even were cured. So notice that around 20% of the mice were literally cured from the cancer. So this is a high-grade glioma. All of them should have died within the first 50 days, but the minibeam treatment cured some of them. So the cancer was literally removed <coughs> or stopped. <coughs> so two years ago, we published a mechanism to try to explain this. <coughs> and that's what we are actively now testing in the lab, how this mechanism works. So what we did is we looked at all the possible chemical elements in the, in the valley, and we saw that H2O2 would be a possible candidate for exactly this effect. So with the radio, uh, with the Monte Carlo code, we studied this diffusion, and then we found that if the radiation is on, you can establish a constant level of H2O2 across the whole area. So although you have a very high peak and valley dose, your H2O2 will be uniform. So you see the difference between the blue, which is the dose, and the red, which is the concentration of H2O2. So because H2O2 is very reactive in the sense of oxidizing, and it's also relatively stable in the medium, <clears throat> you can very quickly establish a uniform distribution of H2O2 during radiation. So we then investigated how long it took to produce this H2O2, and we measured it to be, in, uh, not measured, the simulation provided around 10 to 100 nanoseconds. So it's very quickly at achieving the stability point. So once the radiation is on within 10 to 100 nanoseconds, you have a very high level of concentration spread out through the whole tumor. So then we decided to, uh, to use our model to all the experimental data that we had until then. And one of them was the Prezado data, but there was a few other publications from the group in Munich, uh, Dombrowski into 20 and also the group in uh, Grenoble, where they did the microbeam studies in 2008. So there were four sets of data. And what the model predicted is the amount of time that you needed to, to irradiate the, the regions to achieve a homogeneous distribution of H2O2. So in the mini beams, because the distance between the two peaks is much higher, you need a longer time to achieve the so-called homogeneous region. But as your peak to valley, as your CTC gets smaller, you need less time. So in the microbeams, you need less and less time to, to, to fill the gap. So you see the one that needs most time is the one that has the highest distance, the one, then the next one and the next. And the one with 100 micrometers, which is very small distance, you only need around 0.7 seconds. That's what the model predicted. And if we compare it to experimental times, we see that in the case of Yolanda, she did take around 2,100 2, seconds to radiate. In the case of the Dombrowski, she ended up taking much, much longer in her irradiation. But the funny thing is the group in Grenoble, for the both their experiments, they used the same irradiation time. They used one second for the 200 micrometer one, and they used one second for the 100 micrometer. And at the time, <clears throat> they were unclear why the 200 micrometer was a failure in treating cancer, while the 100 micrometer was very successful. So here is the curve that we predicted. We predicted that if you reach a level of uniformity of H2O2 that allows you to reach all the cancer, you should have a cure. And that's what we predicted, that the 100 micrometer would be a much better treatment core outcome than the 200 micrometer. And in reality, the, the results they obtained were you would have 50% survival here with 100. They observed 50% survival of their mice with 100 and they observed close to zero survival with the 200. So this was a big step. We showed why the narrower beams are better for, for mini beams and micro beams. And it was a big step because they did, they observed exactly the opposite in the experiment they were. I mean, they observed exactly what we predicted. 
So the main ideas for the microbeam and the mini beams, <clears throat> well, microbeam irradiation at the moment is not possible. So it's a major thing because it's really difficult to deliver these microbeams. So it's something that will be unlikely to happen in the future. But mini beams, that is for sure something that can happen. But in order to use it, we really need to know what's happening in the valley region. So in the valley region, the radiation is producing no DNA damage. That means it's not killing cells. The cells are alive. So if my cancer cells are alive, why is it that I can stop the cancer? That's the main question. So how do I stop the cancer without killing it with radiation? And so I want to highlight the main, uh, the main ideas that I think are uh, or main questions which are important in, in the future challenges. In the radiation, I've mentioned already the immune response. How do we maximize immune response? How do we reduce metastatic nature of cancers with triggering the abscopal effect? In the flash, why is the flash effect even working? It's amazing that by just increasing the dose rate to 500 times more, you have this protection occurring. Then the question is, how do we implement clinically flash? We don't know how to do multi-beams. It's extremely complicated to do that at the moment. And then in the case of the micro mini beams, <clears throat> The key idea is we don't understand the mechanism. Why is it in the valley region I have cancer? I don't produce DNA damage of the cancer, but I can stop the cancer from growing. So this is a big, big question. So at the moment with our model with H202, we think it's related to H202. We are now presently actively working on that, on how the H202 works. All right, and that's my group. Uh, that's a picture of Heidelberg. And any, any questions are welcome. I apologize that I had a small problem with my voice midway through. Uh, I hope you understood the, my uh, talk at that point. Yeah, it was perfectly understandable. Thank you so much for your presentation. Quite visual. Um, speaking as someone who's not in the field and I was able to, I really enjoyed the pictures you chose to explain the flash, the flash kind of therapy. So good job with that. We do have Carol, you have your hand raised, so go ahead. Can you, I will ask you to unmute, so you should be able to unmute yourself. Let me un unshare. Hi, Joao. Uh, Hi, Carol. Fant fantastic talk. Thank you very much. It really is uh, fascinating. I have, I'm a little bit confused um, for a standard uh, fractionation. Uh, why would you not stop at around 30 gray, but continue if the immune system's response is not that positive. When you mean 30 gray, do you mean 30 gray in one shot or do you mean 30 gray? No, 30 gray fra fractionated, say over, over 10 uh, uh, sessions. So as long as you provide the dose in the, in, the, in the fraction of three to 10 gray, you can go as high as you want. It will, it will only matter on the toxicity of your total dose. So say I want to treat uh, prostate in the US, in some cases you treat 80, 90 gray, you could treat, you know, probably at the, at high, at say eight or nine gray per fraction, you could probably treat less dose, of course, but you can go as high as you want. So it's a matter of toxicity. And the maximum dose you give is usually related to the uh, to tumor control compared to the toxicity. So the clinicians will go as high as they can with minimal effects. And this is very Europe, this is very specific to each country in, in the uk they were treating 74 gray maximum dose so it, it changes a lot from country to country thank you thanks i have a question in the chat and i'll read it out loud did you validate the model of h202 coverage beyond mathematical models do did oh okay so now we haven't we are now in the process of validating it in two studies I'm working actively with the Mayo Clinic where we have an animal study going, where we're testing this in animal studies, uh, in an animal model they've developed based on the design that I gave them. And we're testing it here at the, at the DKFC in vitro also to investigate how and why this H202 has this magic effect. So something is happening to the cancer cells. So you have to remember, we are not killing them. We're not producing DNA damage. So the cells are literally alive. So we must be switching them off their ability to reproduce is somehow switched off. We are trying to see how this is occurring through ROS. So H202 is a form of ROS that could trigger a change in the property of the, of the cell. And we're trying to see if that change is specific to H202 or not. Thank you. I'm hoping that flight to the question to the person who sent it over. Okay, we have another one. Um, which carbon ion beams 
work better in protein therapy. Sorry, I missed that. Which carbon ions work better in protein therapy? Carbon ion beams work better for protein th therapy. Oh, I'm confused with the question. So, <clears throat> so the carbon ions are important above everything for hypoxic tumors. And when you combine them with proton therapy, you want to use the carbon ions to boost the region that has hypoxic. So when you do a combination therapy, uh, you want to use the carbon to hit the region that is a hypoxic. I suspect Nicholas and Hans-Peter might mention some of these mixed ions, uh, but it's one of the ideas that happens already from, from around 20 years ago. If you mix two ions, you target one part of the cancer through the, through the carbon ion, which is heavier, which is usually the hypoxia region, and then you can treat the rest with the proton. So that's how you would usually tend to mix them. Thank you. I, I'm the person who asked that didn't ask for further clarification, so I think <laughs> you nailed it. Um, if, are there any other questions? You can raise your hand now if you want to. If there's no further questions, I think you can move on. Thank you so much, Ron. We have people giving me great feedback on the chat, so good job and thank you for your slides. Oh, we have some reactions as well. So that's what one person wants at Zoom. 